We'll turn together this morning to the book of Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, in a message that we have entitled, Go Tell John Again. Go Tell John Again. Matthew writes in Matthew 11, 1, And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John, that is to say John the Baptist, had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. In our passages today, this paragraph between 1 and 6 of Matthew chapter 11, we look at a very interesting and thought-inspiring interaction between the Lord Jesus and certain of the disciples of John the Baptist. And in this message today, Lord willing, we'll consider the nature of John's question, why he's asking what he's asking, some possible options about why John is asking what he is asking, his current predicament at the time of his sending them unto him, and we'll also consider Jesus' response, which included a list of miraculous works which were intended to bolster the faith of either John himself or these disciples that John had sent unto Jesus. You might notice in this passage, verse 2, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. The last that we read of John the Baptist in the book of Matthew, the last thing you know of John the Baptist, he is a free man. He's traveling about, he's preaching, and he is baptizing people with the baptism of repentance. As we know, and as Jesus would say in the interactions following this conversation, John the Baptist was that promised forerunner, if you will, for the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He would prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a voice that was crying in the wilderness. John is a very special character. He's a pivotal character as a man of God in the history of the kingdom of God in the world. John the Baptist was and is considered the last of the prophets. You know that in the Old Testament, the prophets were originally called seers, S-E-E-R-S, which meant someone who could see visions. Uh, a vision is something that you see. The word vision and seer, those are similar concepts, and they began to be known as the prophets. John is considered to be the last of the prophets, but also the first of the New Testament ministers. And so he's a pivotal figure in that way. We have pivotal figures in the Bible in instances such as that. You might look at Samuel as one of those pivotal figures in that he was one of the last of the judges before they had kings and then one of, of course, he served in the capacity of a prophet later in his ministry to the nation of Israel, his ministry to God. But you have pivotal figures, and John the Baptist is one of these pivotal figures. He paves the way, as it were, for the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. John, at this point in his life, this is near the end of his life, the end of his ministry, had actually been imprisoned. Now, while we are introduced to that concept in Matthew eleven two, when John heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples we actually don't find out in Matthew's gospel why John the Baptist is in prison until Matthew chapter 14 after he had already been beheaded. So skipping to Matthew chapter 14, we'll turn there just briefly. John the Baptist has by this point been beheaded and Matthew references back to the beheading of John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 14. 
At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus, what sparks this reference back to the death of John. Herod had heard of Jesus, the fame of Jesus, and he said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. And so we learn that John the Baptist has been executed because the man who had him executed now says, well, John the Baptist must be risen from the dead when he heard of the fame of Jesus of Nazareth. He said this is John the Baptist risen from the dead. Now you notice that this is Herod the Tetrarch, and just for the sake of history and the identification of who this particular Herod is, when you read in the New Testament Herod, sometimes you're not reading of the same person named Herod. The Herod family was a family of people who were part Israelite and part Edomite, which meant that they were the offspring of Esau. They were descendants of Esau and his nation, the nation of Edom. They, the Herod family, were put in a position of rule over Judea by the Romans. And so what an offense and an insult this must have been to the nation of Israel, to the Jews in that day, to have a descendant of Esau ruling over them by the commission of the Roman government. You have in the early gospel accounts, Herod the Great. That was the Herod that issued the decree that slaughtered all the children at the birth of Jesus. You know, the Jesus family flees into Egypt and then they return and then go up into Nazareth where Jesus is raised. That was Herod the Great and Jesus' family would come back after the death of Herod the Great. You also have Herod Agrippa, which is the Herod in the early portion of the book of Acts. You'll remember that when he gave an oration, the people heard him speak and they said, it is the voice of a God and not the voice of a man. And because he gave not God the glory, because he was willing to receive that worship, God struck him down with an infection of worms and he died of that infection of worms as a judgment upon him. And there's some interesting myths or folklores you might call them traditions or histories, we don't know if they're true or not, about the way that God informed him that this was going to happen. He saw an omen, I believe it was an owl, according to tradition, and when he saw that, he understood that he was going to die. This infection of worms was not what I like to refer to as Indiana Jones-style infection of worms, where they all come up out of the ground and eat you, and then the skeleton is left. You know what I'm talking about? It's not like that. He was stricken with an infection of worms, and it was a very lengthy, agonizing, disgusting way to die. He would not be the first man who was in political authority who would die in that way. Uh, back in the Old Testament, in the period between the Old and the New, after the rebuilding of the temple, after the days of Ezra and Malachi, before the days of John the Baptist, you know there were some 400 years, there was a man named Antiochus Epiphanes who was a great persecutor of the Jews, who banned circumcision and made desolate the temple, sacrificed a pig on the altar to God and put up an image to a false god in the house of God. And when he attempted genocide against the Jews, Antiochus Epiphanes actually was stricken by God with an infection similar to this of worms. And he was so putrid in his stench that even his servants could not approach unto him in the room he was in. And one of the last things he did was attempt to apologize to the Jews, realizing the handwriting on the wall, so to speak, and attempted to apologize to them and to undo that which was happening to him. And, of course, you know the Lord took him and judged him, killed him in judgment. And then in the later portions of the book of Acts, you have a man named Agrippa. That would be Agrippa II, which was also a Herod. This Herod, however, is Herod the Tetrarch. The Herods, at this point, the reign of them, the political reign, was divided into four. You had these four tetrarchs. This is Herod the Tetrarch. He heard of the fame of Jesus, and he presumed that this was John the Baptist who had risen from the dead. Now, concerning how John the Baptist had been killed, Matthew 14, 3, Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. Why is John 
imprisoned. Herod had him imprisoned because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. John had said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. In other words, Herod had lusted after his brother's wife and had taken his brother's wife to be his own wife. These are winners right here. These are some winners. That's what my mom always used to say about people who might be a little nefarious. That, that's a real winner right there. He takes his brother's wife. And so John, being the prophet that he is, the preacher that he is, when Herod does this, John tells him, it is not lawful for thee to have her. You are violating the laws of God when you took her unto yourself. And so what does Herod do? He has him imprisoned, and when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. Now, this is one of many infinite politicians in the history of the world who couldn't do what they wanted to do because they feared the population, they feared the people. Now, this uh, needs to be taken in its intended meaning. We are not to be rebels. We are not to be people who engage in civil unrest and riotous behavior. The Bible condemns that in both testaments. But at the same time, think about that. You have one man in political authority and thousands of people under their rule. What happens when the thousands of people no longer want to obey the one person in political authority? Well, you have an uprising. You have an insurrection. Sometimes through military force, those are subdued. Sometimes the insurrection is victorious and you have what is known as a coup. And in countries around the world, this happens at least every couple of years. You see where there's some sort of civil unrest. It's happened recently in South America, and it's happened in the Arab world over the past few years. It's a thing that happens in the world. He fears the people. As a politician, he fears the people. And so he didn't put John to death, even though that is what he wanted. However, when Herod's birthday was kept, Here's one of the only birthday celebrations in the Bible. When Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Here's a fine, outstanding example of a godly mama. I want you to come in here and dance in a lewd manner in front of this king who is now my husband, who is the brother of my ex-husband. Uh, if you read the history of the Caesars and you read the history of the Herods and you read the history of some of these ruling families back then, these are messed up people. These are messed up people. I don't intend for any of that to be as funny as it is, but for some reason it is. These are messed up people. Whereupon he promised with an oath, I like the way you dance. I'll give you whatever you want. And she being instructed before of her mother, here you have some of her mother's motivation, in this and sending her to dance said give me here john the Baptist's head in a charger give me his head in a box and the king was sorry nevertheless for the oath's sake and them which sat with him at meat he commanded it to be given her and he sent and beheaded john in the prison and his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel and she brought it to her mother and the disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. So what we read of John the Baptist being in prison in Matthew chapter 11 occurs after the fiasco there of John standing up to Herod and condemning Herod, but before this dancing of the daughter of Herodias and her request to have John the Baptist's head in a charger. Now, there's some things that we can learn about this or from this that uh, are attributable to us today or instructional for us today. This lends some biblical insight into a pastor's role in the political realm. Now, please understand, and, and we harp on this all the time, that God's Word does not espouse a New Testament theocracy. Jesus has a kingdom in the world. His kingdom is right here, right now. It is not of this world. It transcends every socioeconomic status, every bracket, every ethnicity, every race, every nationality, male nor female, bond nor free, Jew nor Greek. We're all the same in Christ. He did not come to establish some sort of 
a Christian democratic republic, his theocracy is the church. And it is a kingdom that breaks into pieces according to Daniel's prophecy of it and infiltrates all of the other nations of this world and permeates through them and influences them. And this kingdom will have no end. It is not of this world. If it were, his servants would fight. This is a kingdom that has no end. It cometh not with observation. It is within you. We are translated into it. There are several, several references to it and the nature of it in the word of God. And so we know that this is not the New Testament age, some age of theocracy where we seek out to make some sort of Christian kingdoms. And that has been attempted if you study the history of of Western society. That has been attempted many times. And generally, whoever are the dissenters, which usually is the Baptist, of the state religion, they're persecuted because they don't go along with whatever the state religion says. What then is the role of the pastor in politics? I submit to you that what John the Baptist did is what the pastor is to do in human society. What did he do? It is unlawful for you to do what you are doing in the sight of God. And so you might put it this way, that the gospel ministry serves in a sense as the conscience, the conscience of the powers that be. We declare unto those who are in authority what is right, what is wrong. They might disregard what we say, like Herod disregarded what John the Baptist said. They may persecute you. They may listen to you. And when they listen to you, much like Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, we actually find blessing for the nation that is influenced by the gospel ministry and the people in that nation. Think about Joseph as he was carried into captivity in Egypt, how God did exalt him. God was with him and God blessed him to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh respects that, and he exalts him. He honored him. He cared for him, and Pharaoh exalts him up even only under his own authority in the entire nation of Egypt. Joseph was a man who, through godly wisdom, influenced that nation to the deliverance not only of that nation, but also the surrounding city-states and the early nation of Israel. One godly man in a position where he could influence the powers that be. And that is, I believe, the biblical role of the gospel minister in human society to declare the word of God to everyone, particularly those who are in authority to say, this is what the King of Kings and Lord of Lords expects of you. Think about that phrase for just a moment. Jesus is the King of Kings. That means that he is the ruler of the rulers. Now, if he is their king, what sort of king has no laws? What sort of king has no rule? What sort of king has no dominion? No, as we read in that psalm, Psalm 75, God raises up, God sits down. God is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And it is the role of us, as it was the role of John the Baptist, to proclaim God's word to the nation around us and serve, in a sense, the conscience of a society. We are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Those are intentional phrases. We serve as a preservative and we serve as illumination. Preservative and illumination. This leads to unpopularity many times. When you stand before a ruler and you say, what you are doing is immoral it is ungodly, and it is wicked. You will find yourself making many enemies in this world. At times, it occasionally leads to persecution. In the case of John the Baptist, it led to his ultimate demise. And so John is in prison here in Matthew 11. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 11, now that you understand the context of what had taken place in John's life. It came to pass when Jesus made an end of commanding his twelve disciples that he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples, and he said unto them, unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Let's examine the meaning of this question. If you know everything there is to know about John the Baptist from the Word of God, 
everything that he said about Christ, which we'll consider momentarily, the things that he affirmed, the things that he believed, the things that he said, you know that this is a very puzzling question to come from John the Baptist. Art thou he? Art thou he? The very question implies some degree of uncertainty, or as we would say it, some degree of doubt. Does John the Baptist at this point in his life doubt that Jesus is the Messiah? Or was there another reason for his asking? Now, the reason I say, was it this or another reason, among our people, you have two general opinions. And as I've studied this this past week, I have learned that not only among our people do you have two general opinions, but among commentators, theologians, and preachers of the word for 2,000 years, you have two different opinions as to the meaning of John the Baptist's request in Matthew eleven three, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Option one is that John the Baptist was legitimately doubting because he was now imprisoned, and he was in the midst of tribulation and persecution, and he experienced doubt. His faith was tried, and his faith began to shake and as his faith began to shake, he sends word to Jesus to ask Jesus to reaffirm his faith again. Option number two is that he sends his disciples to John not because his faith was challenged, but because he wanted to now direct, as he is in prison, his disciples to Jesus. So he sends his disciples to Jesus saying, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? His disciples ask Jesus, and Jesus responds, Yes, I am he that should come. And there are good reasons to believe either of these positions, and that is why it has been so heavily debated, debated over the last 2,000 years. Now, I'm going to share you reasons why either of these would make sense. I'm not going to tell you because I see legitimacy in both of these opinions. And I think there are lessons to be learned in either way this is understood. And so we're going to share both with you today. Option number one, John doubted. Now, as we think about John, the possibility of John doubting here, even that perspective is broken down into two camps. Camp number one, believing that John legitimately doubts because of his affliction he is lamenting his condition. He's in prison. Life is not good. He is discouraged. He is broken. And he is crying out one last time for affirmation of the Christ. Option number two among those that believe that John doubted would be that John believed in what you might refer to as a political Messiah, a Jesus that would come and run the Romans out, run Herod away, and reestablish the nation as it was in the days of David. As we think about this, the reason that people would be skeptical that John was legitimately experiencing true doubt is because of everything that John had said about Jesus previously in their interactions together. And we want to share some of that with you today. In the book of Matthew chapter 3, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Now previously in John's ministry, John predicts in his office as a prophet... I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will throughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And that answers what it means to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Jesus baptizes his disciples all through the book of Acts with the Holy Ghost. And when they were baptized with the Holy Ghost, this isn't to be confused with the new birth. In the new birth, you're born of the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit takes up residence within you. But 
as born again people hear the word and the Spirit falls on them in the book of Acts. They begin to speak with other languages, tongues that they'd never learned. Their infirmities are healed. Sometimes the dead are raised and ministers of the gospel could perform some of these miraculous works. And that is to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. What does it mean to be baptized with fire? We'll look at verse 12. He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That is a baptism that we do not want. That is a baptism that we do not want. To be baptized with fire is to be utterly consumed, immersed, burnt up with unquenchable fire. Why would John say that? This paragraph in verse 7 begins with the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism. And he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? What does he say about the Pharisees, the scribes, in Matthew chapter 23? He asked them how they, being evil, shall escape the damnation of hell. They're whited sepulchers. They look holy on the outside, but on the inside, they're nothing but evil, carnality, death, destruction. And so when John the Baptist sees them, he says, You, you vipers, you snakes, who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come? There in front of John were people who were God's children, but there in front of John the Baptist were people who were not. And that's why he says there are some of you that will be baptized with the Holy Ghost and some of you will be baptized with fire. He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John. That's what sets this up <clears throat> to be baptized of him. How does John respond to the coming of Christ? Jesus comes to be baptized. John forbade him. That's a derivative of to forbid saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And you can understand John's reaction to that. How unworthy would any preacher feel to administer the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ? He is God incarnate, the Word made flesh, God in human flesh. He's perfect. He is holy. John's baptism was the baptism of what? Repentance. And Jesus had no sin to repent of. And yet he comes for baptism. No wonder John the Baptist says, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou to me? And it'll be very clear in John's gospel, we read that Jesus baptized not but his disciples. Jesus never performed a baptism. He didn't come to baptize. That's not why he came. He commissioned his preachers. His preachers baptize. Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. I'm often asked what that phrase means, it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Baptism is a righteous work. It is a good work. If you have not been baptized, then Jesus calls upon you to be baptized if you believe in and love the Lord Jesus. It is a good work, one of the two ordinances of the church. Through it, we find ourselves becoming members of a local assembly. Discipleship and baptism are inseparably connected in the word of God. And so even though Jesus had no sins to repent of, remember that Jesus came into the world to fulfill every commandment of God on behalf of his children. What do you mean by that? Upon the cross of Calvary, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he was made to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might what? Be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus imputes his righteousness to us, which is complete obedience to every command of God. And so if it is a command of God to be baptized, Jesus must then needs be baptized. Everything God requires of you to stand before him was provided in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It becometh us to fulfill 
all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Who is the he who saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove? The word there, he, is a pronoun. Who is the antecedent of that pronoun? You might think Jesus, but in the book of John, we actually read that it is John the Baptist who beheld the Spirit descend on Jesus like a dove. A voice from heaven thundered, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. John witnessed all of those things. In the book of John, chapter 1, John's rendition of the baptism of Jesus. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. What does John say when he sees Jesus coming? It's the Lamb of God, the sacrifice that God would offer to take away the sin of a world of people. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water. The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. In the next paragraph, again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. So this is something that happens more than one time in John the Baptist's ministry. As he begins to point people to Christ. In the book of John chapter 3, as John's disciples and Jesus' disciples interact and John's disciples begin to see Jesus, a question is made because John's disciples would fast and do other things and you have mentioned here the purifying and yet Jesus' disciples do not. Now the reason that Jesus' disciples did not fast is, and this is a question that came up from time to time, is when the bridegroom is gone, you'll fast. When the bridegroom is gone, you'll lament. But when the bridegroom is here, the bride needs to celebrate and rejoice. And so there will be a time for that, Jesus would say, but not now. Right now is the time for rejoicing. They begin to ask about this Christ. Notice what John says about the Christ in verse 30 of John chapter 3. He must increase, but I must decrease. John knew his ministry tapers out as the ministry of Jesus tapers in. And because of those passages... Many, many sound theologians in Christian history have opted to believe that John is not sending these disciples because he doubts, but because he wants his disciples to have confirmation in Christ. He wants their understanding to be that Jesus is the Christ. That being said, some have believed because of Verse 6, blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me, Matthew eleven six. 6, that this was legitimate doubt in the mind of John the Baptist. I'm going to give you a point, so I want you to latch on to that option as we close our message in just a moment. I'm going to give you a point from either of these three understandings. Because whichever understanding of this you have, there's a way that you can apply that to edification in your life. So let's say that John does doubt here. There's a couple of reasons people believe 
Why? Number one, he doubts simply because of his present affliction. He's imprisoned, he preached the word of God, and yet here he is facing death because he simply said, it is not lawful for you to take your brother's wife as your own wife. And so Jesus' reply would be directly to that issue, blessed is he that is not offended in me. The word offended here doesn't mean I'm upset at Jesus. When we use the word offended today, how many times do you see the word offended in the, word, in the world of social media in a week? Everyone's offended. I'm offended, you're offended, and we have parties where we get together in a room and we sit down and we just cry because everyone has offended us. That's life in America in 2019. We're all offended. He has an opinion and it's not mine. How dare he? We need a thicker skin in America today. The word offended here doesn't have that connotation. It carries the idea of being shaken and denying him in moments of tribulation or persecution. So to be offended in him would be when persecution comes to deny him and forsake him for self-preservation. That's what it means to be offended in him in verse 6 blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me some believe that john was doubting because he was looking for a political messiah this option has more traction in my mind than john simply doubting now that jesus is the messiah after all what had he seen the spirit descending on him like a dove he heard the voice of God the Father speak from heaven. He said, this is the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. But what if John's understanding of Jesus was somehow flawed? In that, he's looking for a political Messiah. You say, well, what do you mean by a political Messiah? It was the belief of the Jews in the time leading up to the Messiah, that the Messiah would not be the Christ that we know Jesus was, but that he was the Christ, the Messiah, who would assume the throne of David, which Jesus occupies today, but not in a way that they anticipated it. That he would assume the throne of David. Where did David rule from? Jerusalem. That he would expel the Romans through military might, lead an insurrection against them, that Herod would be dethroned, and that this Messiah would restore Israel to the glory that it experienced in the kingdom of King David. That's very well documented that that was their belief. If you read uh, the, history, uh, the history of the nation of Israel after the time of Christ, it is actually their attempted insurrections against the Romans that led General Titus to besiege the city of Jerusalem, eventually wiping it from the face of the earth. They attempted that on multiple occurrences. That was what they wanted. So let's try that on for a moment. What if John the Baptist is doubting because he believes that Jesus was going to run the Romans out, run Herod out, and assume the rule. The apostles even asked this question in the book of Acts chapter 1 and verse 6. Lord, wilt thou again at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Sometimes we refer to the first century church, and please understand, I'm going to be very clear with what I'm going to say. We refer to the second century church, the third century church, as the church fathers. Sometimes it's better for us to understand them as the church infancy. Some of these doctrines hadn't been spelled out yet in their minds. Now, when the Holy Spirit pours out on the apostles, they have divine inspiration. And you notice in Paul's writings, he never once speaks about a restoration of the political power of the nation of Israel. Why? Because their eyes were now opened. You can read about that in the book of Acts chapter 2. When they go out and the Holy Spirit falls on them and they begin to preach. Jesus said, don't even go out and preach until the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then they knew all things as it were. 
sometimes we should look at our forefathers before God had opened their eyes to the reality of things more as infants than fathers because they didn't know yet. You read some of the church fathers on the divinity of Jesus and there are very questionable things that are written because those debates hadn't happened yet. You read their thoughts on baptism beginning in the second century and we would not accept that as sound today. Why? Because the church was in its infancy and until there was debate over an issue, there was not precision over an issue and generally the debate would come with some sort of division, one side being more precise, one side being less precise. One theory is that John the Baptist is looking for a political messiah. Why would he be looking for a political messiah? Where is he? He's in jail. Who put him in jail? Herod, the imposter king, Herod. That makes sense. Are you going to run them out? Do we look for another? Was I mistaken? Is it time to run him out of town? And what does Jesus do? You go tell him again that which we've seen, that which we've heard. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Option number two is that John was sending his disciples not because he doubted, but that he was sending them with questions to validate Christ in the eyes of his disciples. Either of these positions are legitimate understandings of John's question. Now Jesus responds in a very interesting way. Go and show John again those things which you do see and hear. What things do you see and hear? The blind receive their sight. In Jesus' ministry, he often gave sight to the blind. There were times that he did this in various ways. He might take clay and spit into the clay and or into the dirt and make clay and anoint someone's eyes with it and have them wash and their sight is restored. Those who had been born blind were given back their sight through the ministry of Jesus. The lame walk, and when we say lame today, that's usually what a teenager says about their parents' sense of humor, but the word lame doesn't mean lame like we take it to mean lame, like, well, he's pretty lame. Lame means that you have a physical infirmity. You might be a paraplegic. You may have suffered from polio. You may have a limb that was broken and never healed, and so it is withered, it is damaged. Maybe even an amputee. You might have been stricken with some sort of a disease that leaves you totally infirm where all you can do is lay there. When Jesus healed the lame, that's what he would do. He would cause them to be able to stand and to walk and to run. And might I say... Because occasionally you have a charlatan who advertises this sort of thing and because of adrenaline and emotion, someone might leave there feeling like they're on cloud nine, but after a period of days goes back to their painful condition. When Jesus healed people, they were healed. Documented, real healings. I mean, a polio limb stretching out and becoming normal. Someone who is quadriplegic, standing up and not just walking, not staggering, but running and jumping. You notice this in some of the miracles. People would stand up and they wouldn't just walk, but they would begin to leap. Jesus has healed me. When he healed people, he healed people. Many times people claim that this takes place in the world today, but when you begin to ask them for documentation of this, suddenly it begins to become very suspicious because there is no documentation. Or, well, we healed them. They had cancer. Were they taking chemotherapy? Well, yeah. Okay, if God blesses you with healing through chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery, that's not miraculous. That's providential. Miraculous is when it happens with no means, where you have a tumor... It's on the x-ray, you go back in six weeks, you've had no treatment, you have another follow-up before your surgery, and it's gone. Do those things happen? Yes, they do. That's the difference in providence and a miracle. 
And I think we need to make the distinction in our understanding of it. There's a difference in providentially blessing through medical means and miraculously blessing through God working all by himself. These are miracles. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. Leprosy is an interesting thing, and it's a plague that afflicted them. There are variations of it in the world today, and yet at the same time, some believe that the form of it that they struggled with in that day was not necessarily the same that men struggle with today. But lepers were cleansed. Jesus touched the lepers when all of the men were afraid to be near them, and they had to stand and cry unclean. He healed them through laying hands on them. The deaf hear. He opens the ears of the deaf. The dead are raised up. Jesus raises the dead. In fact, as we understand it, not one single person ever died in the presence of Jesus. Not one person. People didn't die around Jesus. If he shows up after somebody had died, guess what happened? They always get risen again. You know, we talk about preachers often secondary as a part-time job in funeral homes because we have that, I guess, bedside manner and a closet full of gray suits, and so it just seems like a natural combination. We, and we joke about it being, well, that's at least one type of business that you can be in that you always have job security because it's like being a mechanic. Your, your air conditioner is always going to break. Your car is always going to break. People are always going to die. And so there's always job security, but not when Jesus was around. When Jesus was around, the dead were raised. Over the next few weeks, I hope to go through the order of these miracles and maybe devote a message to each type of miracle themselves and look at some of the miraculous works of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we'll enjoy that study together. The dead are raised, and listen to this one. The poor have the gospel preached to them. Do you realize that when the gospel is preached, a miracle has occurred? But think about this description, this qualifier that Jesus adds. Not just that the gospel is preached, but that the gospel is preached to the poor. The people who didn't have anything else in this world that the rest of society looked at, looked down their nose at, pushed to the outskirts, the people who weren't invited to the banquets, the people who weren't invited to the proms and parties and balls, but the people that were ostracized. Jesus preached the gospel to the poor. And he lists that with these five other miracles as something to tell John, tell him again. Now, as we draw near to the close and we know that that time is almost away. There's a prophetic significance in the things that Jesus said in this passage. Isaiah 29, in verse 18, the speaking of the day of the Messiah. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book. You ever fathom when Jesus gave someone their hearing what the next thing is that they heard? He gives them their hearing... And then he preaches to them. So not only is the thing that they hear the voice of the Son of God, but it's usually the voice of the Son of God preaching his own gospel to them. In that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. For the terrible one is brought to naught, and the scorner is consumed, and all that watch for iniquity are cut off. That make a man an offender for a word, those would be the Pharisees, and lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate, and turn aside the just for a thing of naught. When is this? When God sends the Holy One of Jacob. Verse 23. Jesus is citing passages such as this. Isaiah chapter 35. We'll begin in verse 3. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Paul quotes that in the book of Hebrews with reference to today. 
Say to them that are of a, faith, a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Now what if John does have a fearful heart? Then what Jesus quotes to strengthen his fearful heart, you're about to read. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. And the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart that's a deer. And the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out in streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water. This is imagery of restoration and deliverance. And later in this passage you have the way of holiness. You have... The ransomed of the Lord returning in verse 10. Everlasting joy upon their heads, singing with gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. That's prophetic of the day of the Messiah. And so when Jesus chooses these words, this is not coincidental or incidental. He's telling John, this is the day of the Messiah. Go show him, go tell his disciples, whichever way you understand it. Go tell them the things that you've seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. The poor have the gospel preached unto him. That's six. You almost anticipate the seventh. You almost anticipate the seventh. What would the seventh type of miracle be that Jesus could perform on a human being? In the book of Luke chapter 7, which is the other rendition of this, Jesus immediately goes in their presence, and what does he do? He casts out evil spirits. Casting out of evil spirits being the seventh, you have the complete way of healing that Christ brought to his children in that day. What are our takeaways from today's message Number one, if John was doubting, what can we learn from the doubt of John the Baptist? Because if he doubted, then certainly you and I could doubt. The takeaway would be that we all need our faith strengthened from time to time. Have you ever needed your faith strengthened? I have. And I believe that you have too. What do we need when our faith is challenged? We need to remember those things that we have already seen. Go tell him again. Paul said to the Philippians, to write the same things unto you, for me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Peter writes, 2 Peter in chapter 3 and verse 1, he writes unto them to stir up their pure minds by way of what? Remembrance. When your faith is attacked, return Return to the sanctuary of the Lord, as it were. Remember the things that you've seen Jesus do in your life. If he was looking for a political Messiah, what is the takeaway? That we all need to define Jesus according to his word if we are to have the correct expectations in this life of what Jesus is going to do. I've made this point many times lately that we don't need to invent a Jesus. We need to believe in the Jesus of the Bible. If John was looking for a political Messiah, then John was misunderstanding the very purpose of the coming of Christ into the world. He didn't come into this world to run out the Romans. He didn't come into this world to evict Herod from the throne. He came into this world to establish a kingdom that is not of this world, that would spread through the entire globe, even to the uttermost parts of the earth, Acts chapter 1. Takeaway two is that we need to look for the Jesus of the scriptures, not the Jesus of popular culture. Number three, if Jesus and John here are interacting to point John's disciples to the Messiah, art thou he for our sake, we ask, or do we look for another? You think about the following of John the Baptist, and this is something that every preacher in America needs to hear today. He must increase, we must decrease. 
Our service to Christ is not about us having many followers. It's not about empire building. Our service to Christ is about leading people to follow Jesus. And so the ministry that we engage in and conduct here is not for the sake of Ben Winslet having more people to talk to on Sunday morning. It's about leading all of you to a closer walk with the Lord Jesus Christ.